Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Photographs in the Archive, Arranging and Describing Visual Materials. I'm Amanda Murray, Preservation Specialist for DIPSNY. Today, we'll be discussing considerations for successfully arranging and describing visual materials with the goals of gaining intellectual and physical control, as well as providing access points. We'll also touch on preservation considerations. So let's get started. If you have any sound or technical issues along the way, please let us know in the chat. The Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York, or DIPSNY as we like to call it, is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions across New York State that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical records and unique library research materials. DIPSNY's services include archival needs assessments, preservation and condition surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and access to a variety of educational programs and workshops. DIPSNY is a collaboration between two long-running New York programs dedicated to service and support for archival and library research collections throughout the state. The New York State Archives Documentary Heritage Program and the New York State Library Conservation Preservation Program. DIPSNY is a program of the New York State Education Department with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. And to be clear, the Documentary Heritage and Conservation Preservation Programs are still funding projects outside of DIPSNY, and the Conservation Preservation Program application window is currently open, so keep applying for those grants. A little about myself. As I said, I am the Preservation Specialist for DIPSNY, so if you work with DIPSNY for a preservation survey or archival needs assessment, you may end up working with me on that. I also provide educational programs, at the moment mainly webinars and online resources, and assist sites with technical information and preservation questions. I'll be sure at the end to give you my email. I'm always happy to assist with any questions or concerns that come up as you work with your collections. My background is in archives as well as photographic preservation and collections management, and I've worked at various small and large institutions, including both archives and museums. So I have a broad base of cataloging experience and working with photographs, and I'm excited to discuss that with you today. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we dive in. The presentation today is being recorded. My slides and any of the resources I discuss will be sent out to you with the recording link for this webinar within the next week. And we'll have time at the end to answer any questions that come up, but please feel free to type them in the chat at any time, and I'll try to address them as soon as I'm able. So today we're discussing arranging and describing visual materials, but what are visual materials? The Society of American Archivists has a very useful dictionary of archives terminology, which defines visual materials as a term used to collectively describe items of a pictorial nature, including prints, paintings, photographs, motion pictures, and video. I would add to that drawings, negatives, scrapbooks, and slides, as these are also commonly found in archival collections. I'm sure there are many other materials that would fall into this category. The activities around arranging and describing that we'll discuss today will focus mainly on photographs, but a lot of the concepts can be applied to most other two-dimensional visual materials. Defining visual materials is important in terms of arrangement and description because visual materials have inherent properties that require some different ways of thinking about arrangement and description. When we're describing textual materials, we are provided with the vocabulary with which to interpret those materials through the words on the page. When we're describing visual materials, we are often tasked with translating visual information into words and assigning the right subjects to create access. This should be done without placing any connotations or meanings on those materials that isn't inherently there. We want to think about creating access points for the myriad of different ways these materials may be used without assigning our own judgment values. And an added element to consider for visual materials is that not only are we translating visual information into text in our descriptions, we also have to find ways to convey information about the objects themselves, as visual materials are often of research value as an object as much as for the visual information they contain. Which brings us to our goal for today, to think about what specific considerations should be given to arranging and describing visual materials. Today we'll be building off of a foundational knowledge of arrangement and description for paper materials, and if you need more information about those topics, Please check out the webinars page on the DIPSNY website 
that is dhpsny.org forward slash webinars, where we have a number of wonderful, freely available recorded webinars to guide you. I'll review some basics as they pertain to our discussion today, but there's a lot of information to cover and a few things that I'll just be touching on. So definitely check those out for more. So when we begin thinking about arrangement, this beginning stage of processing our visual collections, we're working on gaining both intellectual and physical control of our materials. Intellectual control will be completed through description and the creation of a guide or finding aid that will allow staff and researchers to access topics of interest. Physical control will be gained by providing permanent locations for our materials once they are properly housed. In arrangement, we will need to think about both the physical arrangement of the materials and the intellectual arrangement or overall organization of the collection. Physical arrangement often follows intellectual arrangement, but that is not always the case, particularly with visual materials. Visual materials are usually best housed with like materials, such as housing all of your glass plate negatives together, and this will often mean specific types of housing for different material types, such as having separate location for negatives than we do for prints. There are also often more oversized materials within our visual collections that have different storage requirements and may even be stored in separate locations in the bulk of the collection. So the intellectual control that we provide, whether in a guide or catalog record, will be key to locating these materials and maintaining connections throughout the collection. When we think about arranging our visual collections, we're going to follow the same methods of, of arrangement as we do for any other collection materials. Our collections can be organized based on these levels of arrangement, beginning with the collection itself. You may be working with a singular collection that is entirely photographs that you need to divide into individual series, or you may be working with a series of photographs within a larger collection. Determine how you can provide the best access to these materials and at what level the most comprehensive description can be added. Archival arrangement is hierarchical, so any information we assign at the collection level carries down to the series below, and similarly, any information from the series level carries down to the files and items below. A single series titled photographs may be enough to provide access to that grouping if they all share similarities, such as format or subject matter. Perhaps that set of photographs can be made more accessible when broken down into subseries, in which case you would provide a second level of, of arrangement by subject, time period, or photographer where relevant. Sometimes we're working with photographs mixed into a larger collection, interfiled with paper materials. And in that case, their arrangement will follow the largest schema for the entire collection. When we use description to provide added points of access to specifically those materials as needed, which we'll discuss in a bit. I would encourage you to think wholly and with the bigger picture in mind. It is easy with visual materials in particular to overarrange and overdescribe in our efforts to make materials readily available. Our arrangement of the materials should provide a basic level of access, and we'll use description to provide additional access. So what are some ways to start thinking about arranging our photographs? Whether we are reprocessing current collections or providing access to new collections, we're going to think about the same elements. Of course, if there is a discernible order, original, original order established by the creator, the arrangement and description should reflect that. If that's the case, the arrangement work can quickly transition into providing physical housings and permanent storage locations based on that original order. If there isn't an original order, however, there are a number of ways to think about arranging visual collections. It is common to see visual materials arranged by maker if they're from a specific photographer or printer by subject, such as a series of photographs of the Grand Canyon, or by format, such as postcards, negatives, or slides. All of these are fine ways to arrange photographs. The important thing is to get a sense of the totality of the collection and make a plan first before beginning the arrangement so that you know you are arranging in a way that will be most efficient with your time and provide the best access for everything in the collection. There's a wonderful webinar on the Dipsy website about creating a processing plan if you need a refresher before beginning as having a plan can be incredibly helpful. So how do we know what the best way to arrange a set of photographs may be? Consider the reason for collecting those materials. What is most important about them? What is their significance? Why were they collected? How do you think researchers will use those materials? If we're looking at a group of visual materials within a larger collection, how are the other materials within that collection arranged? For example, a collection of travel photographs may be best suited to arrangement by subject with a different series for each country. Because the purpose of these photographs is to depict 
views from different geographic or cultural landmarks. A collection focused on the history of photography may be best organized by process or format, since these elements tell us so much about a photograph's creation and use, and that is the way I would expect researchers to use those materials. A collection of photographs by several well-known photographers would be well-suited to arrangement by photographer, as these materials will most likely be accessed for this purpose. Again, think critically and with the entirety of the collection in mind when determining the method of arrangement. We can always provide additional information in the description to enhance access if there are, and there usually are, multiple ways in which these materials will be used. Once you've decided on the intellectual arrangement, the next step is to physically arrange the collection. This includes providing housings and permanent storage locations for the entire collection. A few notes on handling photographs. You will likely be going through the same material several times as you determine your arrangement and provide description. It's essential to use proper handling procedures to protect collection materials. Things to keep in mind when handling photographic collections for processing. Always use nitrile gloves when handling photographs and keep fingers off of emulsion surfaces. This will ensure no fingerprints are left on photographic images. Always hold materials with two hands to keep from denting, bending, or cracking photographs or mounts. Photographic supports and mounts especially can become brittle over time, so use care to keep from causing tears or other damage. Make sure you have enough empty workspace to allow movement of materials without damage. When you pick something up, make sure you already have a place cleared to move it to and a clear path to get there. Planning ahead in this way can ensure the safety of the materials as you move them around while housing and physically arranging. Use a support board when moving oversized or fragile materials for added stability. And keep anything that can scratch photographic surfaces away from your workspace, or at least off to the side. This includes dangling bracelets or jewelry on your person, as well as pencil or eraser bits used in marking housings. Anything small, like bits of rubber or eraser marks, will stick to emulsion surfaces and can damage photographs, so be sure to keep your work surface clean. Write on any archival enclosures before putting photographs inside, and refrain from writing information about the photograph on the back but rather record it in your description or if needed on the outside of your archival enclosures. It makes it difficult to discern what is an original caption or note on the photograph by the creator if we add information onto the item and writing on photographic materials can cause damage. If you do want to mark photographs with an accession number or some other short identification code on the back, use a soft pencil and avoid pressing too hard as this can emboss the image surface and can cause damage to the photograph. Handling guidelines are important for both staff and researchers, and it is important to have written guidelines to follow for all. If you need help building those guidelines, Dipsney has other webinars that go more in depth on proper handling procedures. Amelia's Parks Preservation in Exhibits is a great place to start, and that recording is again on the Dipsney webinar website under webinars. You will also be dealing with housings as part of the processing of your collections. An in-depth discussion of photographic housings could take up its own entire webinar, so I won't go in depth here, but just wanted to provide some basic reminders. All of your housings should be acid-free, lignin-free, and for most materials, buffered is also fine. If you have cyanotypes or blueprints, you do wanna be sure to use unbuffered materials with those. All of your housing materials should also pass the photographic activity test, or PAT, which means that housings won't react with photographs and cause further det deterioration. All of these specifications can be found listed on the product page with any archival suppliers. All housing material, materials labeled archival are not created equally, so if they aren't labeled with these specific terms, don't assume those materials check these boxes. Be sure to ask questions of the supplier and confirm. Your overall goal in choosing housings for photographic materials is to protect photographic surfaces and prevent materials from bending, breaking, being dented, or being damaged. So when you're thinking about the selection of materials, consider how those materials will be stored and how they will be handled and used by both staff and researchers. Jillian Marcus did an excellent webinar about housing basics. And just a couple of weeks ago, CCAHA's photograph conservator, Barb Lemon, presented a webinar on what to look for in terms of conservation concerns in your photographic collections. Both are great resources to provide more on housings and collections care for photographs and are available on the DIPSNY website. I'll also provide a link at the end to a technical leaflet on choosing housing materials for photographic storage. Once physical arrangement is complete, our next goal is to provide description. 
Description is simply data that we create to represent our archival resources and thereby provide access to these resources. I wanted to pause before we get into the details of description to discuss photographic process and format. Just briefly, I think it's important for our purposes to understand how much information we can glean from knowing what type of photograph we're working with. Oftentimes we'll be given information about our visual materials through the process of acquisition, whether that is through information provided in accession paperwork or information provided in the collection itself. If we have materials that don't have any of that though, we'll need to be able to supply our own to the best of our abilities. Being able to determine photographic process and format are really useful tools when thinking about describing photographs as they can provide us with a lot of information in terms of dates, purposes, production, and creation of a photographic object. For our purposes in discussing photographs specifically, I'm defining process as the method by which a photograph was made, such as a silver gelatin print or a daguerreotype, um, and format as the method of presentation, such as a stereo view, postcard, or carte de visite. Understanding the format of photographs helps us determine their intended audience and use, which can give us a lot of information about the photographs themselves as well. Here we have a studio portrait, so I can extrapolate that it was meant for personal use. If we had a set of published stereo views, we know that these would have been mass produced by a publishing company for popular viewing. This information can help us provide the context for visual materials as we work on creating descriptions. The history of photography is also very much tied to changes in technology and practice. Being able to identify common processes can help us date images as well as provide contextual information based on when those processes were used. We'll talk more about this when we discuss the date element of description in a bit. Photographic processes also determine the best preservation methods for our photographs, such as determining what type of housing is best or if we should use cold storage. So there's a lot we can discern about the creation of a photograph just from looking at the object. All of this being said, you don't have to be an expert at photographic identification in order to provide access points to your collection materials. Don't let this be the reason that you avoid working with these materials or feel overwhelmed working with visual materials. Our goal is to provide the most information we can without assigning any designations we aren't sure of. In some cases, that may mean that we can only provide some very basic information and that's okay. There's only so much time we can devote to this process and documenting what is unknown about a group of materials can also be really helpful. So today we'll be discussing elements of description in accordance with JACS, the archival content standard maintained by the Society of American Archivists. Um, I'll also be referencing at some points the companion manual for graphic materials, descriptive cataloging of rare materials graphics or DCRMG created by the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of the American Library Association. Both are freely available online and I've included a link at the end. DAX is a content standard or a set of formal rules that specifies the content, order, and syntax of information to promote consistency. DCRMG provides additional guidance on entering information for rare materials and in this case, specifically on graphics or visual materials. If you need a review of the basics of DAX, there is of course a DITSME webinar for that as well. Um, I did just want to mention that there are other standards for describing visual materials. There is a standard called Cataloging Cultural Objects, a guide to describing cultural objects and their images, also known as CCO. The standard might match up more with the terminology used in a museum setting. So if anyone is coming from a museum background and is interested in more information on that, please get a hold of me and I'd be happy to share some resources. I'm basing our discussion today on DAX because of its broad use in the archival setting, and I know a lot of our institutions may already be using that standard to describe materials. That isn't to say that DAX is the standard you have to use. The key is consistency. I'm going to talk through how I would enter all of this information based on these standards, but your institution may have other written rules about formatting and style that you need to maintain. So all of this is just to say that our discussion today is meant to provide a general framework of information that is really useful and providing access to visual materials specifically. How you institute that and the particulars of data entry and presentation are going to depend on your own institution's specific guidelines. The elements of description that we are going to be discussing are listed here. Those in black type are required fields in JAX. And those in blue are considered added value that we'll be including today. We'll build on the basics to discuss additional factors that are relevant to visual materials and can help provide the best sense of the materials to researchers and patrons who haven't seen those objects in person yet. We'll talk through each of these elements individually and then I'll provide a couple of examples. 
One will be providing a group or series level description and the other at the item level. When thinking about the level of description, there is a common desire to describe photographs on an item level. I wanted to point out here that this is not necessary. We can provide access to photographs on a number of levels, and I would really encourage you, especially if you're working with large collections or large backlog, to think in terms of series or folder level descriptions of photographs first. Describing photographs on an item level is very resource intensive and time consuming. Even as a photo cataloger working specifically with photographs all the time and with lots of experience doing item level description, I can say it's still really time consuming. Realistically, looking at all the responsibilities we balance in collections care and management, staff and volunteer time, it's important to take a step back and think about the bigger picture. Work on providing the higher level of description at first pass, and then go back and add more finite description where you feel it's needed. Reasons you may want to consider item level description are because an item is high use, high value, or rare, and maybe there are only a few photographs in the collection. Be sure that any time you are adding an item level description, it is adding value to that description and to the ability to find and access those materials. If you are repeating most of the information that is already recorded at a higher level, meaning file, series, or collection, it may not be worth the effort to provide item level description right away. It may also be that within one collection, you have a mix of item level and group level description. Maybe most materials have series or sub-series level descriptions, but you have one photograph that is of major significance and is requested often. You can provide item level description for that single object without providing it for the other 100 photographs in the collection. If we're talking about adding description or re-describing materials, there are a couple of additional considerations. I know some institutions already have item level descriptions that were done at an earlier time and may need to be transferred over to a new system. If you have collections that are previously described at an item level and you're working on re-describing, be sure to keep that item level description as documentation to be added back in as appropriate, but still consider providing that series or folder level access at first pass especially if you're moving from a paper-based format that would need to be transcribed. Then let's take a look at specific elements of description that are important to describing visual materials. These elements are all approached in a similar way, whether we are providing series, folder, or item level descriptions. And when we talk about a couple of specific examples, I'll know anywhere where these differ. The titles of the elements you'll see used in this presentation are based on the updated DAX rules, version 2019.0.3. So some have a bit of different language than you may be used to seeing. Just to emphasize this point, even if you are using different fields or a different standard altogether, the types of information you want to collect remain the same. So titles, of course, identify the materials. It is quite common with visual materials to have to apply descriptive titles. Published materials may have printed titles on the objects that can be used here. And I would say that if this is the case, it's oftentimes a good idea to include a note to let the reader know that the title is on the object. And this comes into play a lot more with item level description, but is especially important when using printed titles that have misspellings, old locations, or outdated terminology or information, so that it's evident why this is left in. This can then be explained in the scope and content. When writing descriptive titles, try not to make qualitative statements or use subjective language. Instead, use objective terms. Providing dates for visual materials, we will most often be talking about a creation date, the date that the photograph was taken, but this can also include print or publication dates. If you have an exact date, you'll enter, enter it as a single date entry, if you know a specific time period in which the photograph was likely taken, you can provide a date range to frame that creation date. Here's where photographs lend themselves to being able to estimate a correct date. Earlier, we talked about being able to determine a date based on the photographic process or sometimes format. For example, daguerreotypes, one of the earliest photographic processes, were only popular for a little over a decade before other processes took over in popularity. So we know if we have a daguerreotype in our collection, it can narrow down the creation date to a small window. If we have color Polaroids, we know we can at least date those materials to the late 20th century. Knowing the photographic process can help us date photographs, at least within a more specific range. 
Um, the Image Permanence Institute out of the Rochester Institute for Technology has an incredible resource called Graphics Atlas. This website will not only allow you to help determine what type of photograph you have based on the characteristics of the objects, they also have a great timeline to help determine those relative creation dates based on when those processes and formats were most commonly in use. Another place to look for guidance in knowing what type of process you're looking at can be in the objects themselves. Modern photographs often have back printing on the versos, and we can often find proprietary names for the photographic process included here. We can also use clues within the visual elements of the photograph to at least place the creation with a specific decade or part of a century. For instance, clothing and cars are really great tools to help assign circuit dates to images. Simple Google searches can help. Uh, searching World War I and World War II military uniforms can help discern which period the photographs you're looking at are from. There's a great book called Dress for the Photographer that discusses fashion from the mid 19th to early 20th century and how we can use that to date photographs. And there are several publications out there that are meant to help with this process. Use what you can of the visual clues in the photograph to help provide context. If you're really unsure, you can provide broader ranges, such as saying the late 20th century. Something you will come across that can be of particular importance to photo historians and other researchers. Sometimes a photograph will have been taken earlier, but you hold a later print. If there is a large gap, say the photograph was an 1870s studio portrait, but you have a reproduction copy made in the 1980s, use inclusive dates to describe the date of the original creation as well as note that the photograph was printed later. This will give researchers a much better sense of the origin of the object as well as the content of the photograph. Be consistent in the way you phrase and enter your date ranges. This will help staff know how to enter future records and help researchers better understand and navigate your holdings. And then thinking about adding the creators, with photographs, we could be referring to a photographer, a publisher, or a printer. Use authority records, whether local or one such as the union list of art artist names maintained by the Getty, to format names in the records. Maintain internal consistency in naming formats so that you don't end up with fixed forms of one name in your records. And use unknown if you don't know who the creator is so that researchers aren't left wondering if this information isn't available or just wasn't included. It's good to be upfront about what we don't know as well as what we do. A note here, your sitters or subjects of the photograph should not be included here. They can be noted in the scope and content notes or listed as subjects later on in your record. Archival collections are usually described in linear feet to determine the extent. For visual materials, the extent is more likely to denote the number of objects unless you have a really large collection. The numeric entry is then followed by the physical material type, which can include some physical description, such as 40 negatives or 100 black and white photographs. You can also include object dimensions in the extent, and I'll provide more on that in the examples we'll take a look at in a bit. Scope and content notes should include information about the nature of the materials and activities reflected. The object is to enable users to judge potential relevance. This information can include subjects, such as people, places, events, or topics, geographic locations, add more information about dates or forms of materials, and overall complete the description. Here's where if we're describing materials on a folder level, we could include information about additional subjects, important sitters, or the nature of the objects. Use objective language here. We're not interpreting, rather providing content and context and creating access points for researchers to then interpret on their own. Keeping in mind that visual materials can often be interpreted in various ways depending on the goals of the researcher. The system of arrangement just describes the organization of the collection. Here's where it's really helpful to note whether this was the original order, which may convey some meaning for future staff or researchers working with the collection, or whether the order was imposed by an archivist. Being transparent about this type of decision-making will allow future staff a clearer understanding of previous decisions made about the collection, which will assist future work with materials. Access conditions are restrictions imposed by the donor or repository, or are regulatory requirements that rest restrict contents due to the nature of the information in the material. You want to be sure to include any of this information in your description to ensure that all restrictions are adhered to. 
And in the current iteration of DAX, there's a separate field for physical access conditions. This is an added value field, which can be particularly useful with visual materials. Sometimes negatives or other photographic materials are stored off-site or in cold storage and would have access restrictions due to the amount of time it takes to retrieve them. Other times we might have copy prints of a set of negatives that researchers should access first before being allowed physical access to the original negatives. Other times photographs may be particularly fragile or sensitive to light and have specific handling instructions or require special permissions or setups to access them. Don't be afraid to put these types of conditions in place to safeguard materials. It's part of balancing providing access with preserving materials so they can continue to be made available for future researchers. And I just wanted to briefly mention the language of the materials field as it is a required DAX element. This will usually be entered at a collection level, so may already be assigned for your mixed collections. But I did just want to note that if you do need to provide this for a collection or series that is entirely visual, it is helpful to look for any captions or subtitles or any other markings to add to this information. For most of us, many of our materials will be in English in the United States, but you can also note that there is no linguistic content if there is absolutely nothing to derive this information from. And I would be sure to indicate where you can make this determination from, such as noting that captions are in English in this field. The subjects, work types, and geographic locations are all elements where we will apply controlled vocabulary terms to aid discoverability. Controlled vocabularies allow us to provide descriptive terms consistently to aid in searchability throughout the collection. This is also important if your materials will be included within a larger database at any time, as controlled vocabularies such as the Library of Congress subject terms are used nationwide. So whether we're applying local controlled vocabularies or some of the more widely used ones, the key here again is consistency. When we're thinking about translating that visual information into text in terms of subjects, we want to apply the most relevant subjects to convey the information. But we don't want to over-describe because we don't want to have images come back in a search that, are, that aren't really relevant. So when we're talking about a group of photographs, maybe we're going to add five major subjects maximum. If we're talking about a, an individual item, I would say have at least one, but maybe a maximum of three, unless there really is a lot going on in the photograph. Think about applying terms that designate specifically what is in the image, as well as the concept it shows, like a photograph of a dog could also be described using the subject of pets. And focus on the major elements, not every detail in the photograph. Subjects can come from the Library of Congress subject headings, or the Library of Congress also maintains the thesaurus for graphic materials and the section referred to as TGM1 lists, but terms that are common subjects for pictorial works. So that can be really helpful. Work types, um, I've also seen this referred to as the genre form field or not as, uh, noted as materials and techniques. Either way, this is where we want to apply terms that describe the object itself. For this, I highly recommend using the Getty's Art and Architecture Thesaurus. The Library of Congress also maintains a portion of the Thesaurus for graphic materials for physical characteristics for these terms, known as TGM2. So TGM2 often provides much broader terms, while the Art and Architecture Thesaurus allows for use of much more specific terms. Apply the most specific terms you're able to solidly assign to the objects. If the most descriptive term you can use is black and white photographs or color photographs, use that. If you know that you have chromogenic prints or gelatin silver prints, assign a specific process. Any of these can provide a better sense of the object. Also using our controlled vocabularies, we can assign geographic locations. This field should be used for locations that are relevant to the information in the image. I would caution you against including information here about the nationality of the photographer or other sorts of tangential locations that can be and often is described elsewhere. And this field is really for adding locations that are relevant to the content of the photographs. Controlled vocabularies that provide structure for these entries are the Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names, or TGN, and the Geographic Names Information System, or GNIS, by the US Geological Survey. So let's take a look at some specific examples to put all of that in context. Just to note here that while my descriptions are based on the standards we've already discussed, the formatting and cataloging are my own, 
So you want to be sure to follow your own institutional style guide when writing your descriptions. So say we have a collection of lantern slides. I want to provide a group level description for these as they were created as a series originally, and I've determined that this is the best way to, in which to provide access. I've titled these Travel Views of Italy as I know these were created for presentation and highlight monuments and architecture of Italy. I don't have the photographer or publisher name, so I've written in unknown. It's good practice to include this as it doesn't take much more time and so that no one is left wondering if that information is missing or just wasn't included in my cataloging. And I've given these a general date of the 1890s. My extent, extent lists that I have 34 of these lantern slides and notes size. You can list either centimeters or inches based on what is preferred at your institution, but maintain consistency with this. Including the dimensions isn't always necessary as it is time consuming, but it's really helpful to include when you have materials that are oversized or where the size isn't what you would assume from the description. So if I was describing a postcard, I would generally assume a certain size. With a group of materials that might be various sizes, such as a group of prints that are five by seven, eight by 10, and 11 by 14, you could list each of those sizes, or you could also note that those materials are all 11 by 14 and smaller. I've given a lot more full description of the materials and the scope and content. These materials don't carry any access conditions, but I've written a note about physical handling due to fragility and handling concerns. This may be another area to create consistent language for a couple of different scenarios, so you can just copy and paste it in when needed. I've noted the language of the materials here pulled from the captions printed in the slides in Italian, English, and German. And I've assigned some general subject terms to the entire set. Since they are all the same process and format, I've listed both of those as well. If I had various processes and formats to include for one set of photographs, I would list all of them here under work types and then explain more fully in the extent or scope and content as appropriate. I've also noted the specific cities in Italy where they that are included in these slides under the geographic locations. If I were going to describe a singular item, perhaps this postcard is part of a personal collection of materials, but is really important because of its singularity or the sitter is someone really well known. So I've included a more specific title and an exact date. This can still be a circa date or a broader range for a single item. I've just given it a single date. I've noted the extent since I'm describing on the item level the most important part here is denoting the postcard and its size and I've included a scope and content note the language pulled from the postcard markings on the back in English and subjects that include a general subject as well as the specific name of the sitter I'm included the format and process under work types and you'll notice I don't have listed a system of arrangement or access conditions here because those would most likely be noted at a higher level of description within this collection. If any of those elements differed for this singular item, I would call them out specifically here so that those accessing the record knew that this object didn't inherit that same information from a higher level of description. I would highly encourage you to document your methods of arrangement and description in your processing manual. While many elements for describing visual objects will follow the same guidelines as other materials in your collections, there are some caveats and it's important to note specifics. In data included, standards, style, and syntax, all of this in your processing manual can ensure consistency moving forward as new staff and volunteers come on board. Having this all written down can save time in training and speed up description work as a guide is available as a reminder instead of having to make the same decisions over and over again. As you work with your visual collections, be sure to note preservation concerns. If new housings are needed but not currently budgeted for, make notes so that these can be taken care of as expediently as possible. And you can plan for these expenses in future budgets or include them in grant proposals. Also make note of any conservation concerns you come across. Noting deterioration of your photographic materials as you see them allows you to target specific areas of concern in your review of materials and make better decisions about when immediate action is needed. It also gives you the opportunity to update handling and access guidelines if materials become more fragile or are seeing more heavy use than expected. While documentation sometimes feels like it will add too much time to the work you're currently doing, it is important. And good documentation now will alleviate time and 
resource constraints later by allowing for planning and preparation. So here are some great resources to help you on your way to providing excellent access to your visual materials. DAX and DCRMG are both fully available online. The publication photographs, Archival Care and Management by Mary Lynn Ritzenthaler and Diane Boat O'Connor is a good reference in general, especially chapters five and six, which focus on arrangement and description. Graphics Atlas is the tool for identification and the timeline of photographic history that I mentioned. And the Center for Art and Historic Artifacts has a technical leaflet on storing your photographic collections that serves as a guide to choosing the proper materials for long-term storage. I've also included the link to the DIPSNY webinar page here, and I noticed in the chat that we had a request for the CCO standards. I will make sure to send those links out when the recording, the webinar recording goes live. All right, I've included my email and phone number here, and I'm happy to connect and help with any collection questions or concerns I can. Um, I've seen a couple of questions come in through the chat, but if there are any other questions, enter them now and I'll take a look here. Um, okay, so there's a question about if there's an archivist created title, like my travel views of Italy, do I need to note that somewhere? Um, I would say that it's generally accepted as um, an archival guide that we, as an archivist, have um, created most of that information from uh, the collection materials itself. But if you wanted to, to make that a practice of noting whether it was an archi archivist created title, you could do that. Um, I think more so noting when you're pulling them directly from the materials is really helpful. I am not seeing any other questions at the moment. Um, oh, a question about negatives in the collection that are deteriorating um, and cold storage, I'm assuming, is the question here. Um, there, we, we also have a Dipsy webinar on cold storage, um, and I will make sure to include that link out. Um, if you have specific questions or want to talk more about that, please send me an email and we can definitely dive into that a little deeper. Um, examples of photo manuals created by archives that are available online. Uh, I, I think there are a couple. Let me um, do some more looking and I don't have specific examples off the top of my head, but if I, um, I can provide those with the other links. Uh, all right, we have um, Okay, so there's a question about Photographs where a person wrote a caption that is incorrect, and how do you rectify that? I, um, I'm assuming the person who wrote a caption that is incorrect might be from the archive rather than the original holder of that photograph. Um, I would just be sure to make to note in your description that that information, while it's on the object, I'm assuming, um, is not correct, and and make sure that you just uh, often there's a place to put a put a, um a, like a kind of a staff centered note that's not necessarily public facing and I would definitely um, include that there so that people know moving forward. Um, so with a large artificial collection of photographs with many different access points, how many Library of Congress subject headings to include in a finding aid? and where at the collection level it's series level. So I would say that if your collection is entirely photographs, um, you have a couple of options. You could provide a couple of, so, so the higher level at which you provide that description, they're gonna be more general subjects. So if you're providing at the collection level, those subjects will have to kind of cover all of the contents of that collection. 
if you can provide them, and, and I think that's good to include those there, but if you can provide more specific subjects at the series level, I would definitely add additional ones there that can help uh, point researchers to the right series to pull for what they're looking for. And, you know, I think I might say in general, like five subjects might be the most, but if you have a really large collection, that's definitely a movable number to reach for. Um, I think that if, you know, your, your photographs are covering more subjects than that, it's definitely worth noting where you can, but you also have to draw a line to not spend too much time adding subjects. So it's definitely worth kind of giving that more full picture of the scoping content as well. All right, question about photo albums. Do you take the pictures out or leave them together? That is a question probably for each specific one. I would say in general, um, I would leave photograph albums together, but if you're seri seeing deterioration on those images because of mounts, supports, um, how that album is put together, then it's definitely worth considering a different way to store and house those materials. Um, if you have a particular example in mind and you want to shoot me an email, we can talk about that more specifically. I'll say, okay, so where or how can you note that you have a duplicate photograph and not an original? Um, I think there's probably a couple places that you can note that. And I definitely explain that in the scope and content note for sure that you have a duplicate photograph. Um, and maybe also if it's applicable, maybe it, I think the scope and content note really was probably the best place to explain that, that it's a duplicate photograph, um, just to give the more full picture of what you have. Um, so when you find captions behind photographs, do you always use them in your description? I often use them in my description, um, as long as they're accurate and you know that you can rely on those captions to provide accurate information. It's less that you have to translate or um, create about the object. And it also just already gives you additional information that we wouldn't already have. Um, that being said, if you're thinking about describing on a higher level, like a series level or a file level, you can kind of pull the major information from a set of captions to, to describing that entire series. But then you could also just note that each individual photograph has cap a caption on the back in your scope and content. And that way, researchers would know that if they're going to come look at those materials, they can find more information about them and it's readily available. So with limited space and funds, should we remove photographs from frames and store them in archival folders or leave them in the frames they were donated in? Um, so this is kind of uh, on a case-by-case case case basis, I would do this. Um, I think that if you are concerned about the deterioration in the frames or um, if they're not original frames, if they're more modern frames put on older photographs, that type of thing, you can definitely consider deframing and storing them in a different way. Um, otherwise, I would say if they're original to the image and they really have a part in the object itself and you might exhibit them or use them in their original frame, you can definitely put them in frame storage. Um, if you are worried though that there's damage, it's causing damage to the photograph, oh, I see, taking them apart might damage the photograph. Yeah, there's definitely ways to create frame storage for your photographs and you don't have to remove them from the frames. Um, but I would say it's definitely, if those frames have no, add no value to the photographs and aren't part of the original object, it's worth considering working with a conservator um, to remove them and store them in, in flat files or archival folders so that they're easier to access and you're also saving storage space. Um, so there's a question about putting photographs into protective sleeves. You don't have to put all of your photographs into protective sleeves. It's especially helpful for photographs that are damaged or have tears. 
um, or photographs that sometimes have ink or other markings on the back that you don't want to um, come off on the photographs behind them. I will say you can still store your photographs together. If you don't have any markings on them or any ink or anything else on the back of the photographs, you can store them together in file, archival file folders. Um, and just be sure that when you're putting them together in boxes that you provide spacers in those boxes to make sure that nothing slumps or bends. Um, protective sleeves that you would want to use. I will, there's a link in my bibliography to proper um, storage enclosures and there's definitely the correct specifications for those there as you go to purchase protective sleeves. I just trying to sift down through the questions here. And, um, resources for digitization. Uh, we can definitely provide some links when we send out information um, in a couple of weeks, or I'm sorry, within the week. <laughs> I'll provide a couple of links to more about digitization. Um, again, I didn't talk specifically about translating this information into metadata in this presentation. Um, but you're going to be thinking about similar elements about the photographs that you have. Um, and so that's going to be an important part of having this information together will only aid in the digitization process and creating that metadata. Is it compulsory to describe photo collections until single item level? No, I definitely think that there are some collections that really um, better, like, can, you can provide all the information that you have about them in a series or file level description. Um, I really think that if you're gonna think about item level description, you want to be positive that you're adding value to that description. It's so time consuming to do that, um, you know, definitely take that first pass and only go back and add that item level description if you feel it's necessary for those materials. If they're not really accessible, add that series or file level description. Um, all right, and then a follow-up to our frame question, what kind of photos would you want to keep in the original frames? Um, I think any that you, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes with frames if they're original, but I, I think for the most part, if you're going to think about exhibiting those materials ever or you have original original frames that you really feel are an integral part of the object itself and i would really strongly consider keeping them but otherwise um, i think it's it's fine to consider deframing those materials you can also always deframe them and store frames separately which um, i don't know if that's always the most space saving but it's an option to provide that access um, and so yes just to confirm all of the slides and the resources will be sent out within the week along with the webinar recording. Um, I know I missed some questions in here, um, probably some photographic housing questions. Um, so if there's something that I didn't answer that we, um, you had a question about in terms of photographic housings, please um, let me know, send me an email. I'm happy, I'm always happy to talk photographic housings. It's one of my favorite things. So <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And um, hopefully the resources will be a good starting point. But again, let me know if there's anything specific. Yes. Are there any other questions that I can answer now? If not, um, again, get in touch with me with anything else that comes up. And please feel free to reach out at any time. Disney staff is always here to answer your questions. So thanks so much for joining us today.